Hey, I'm Beth Riley, and this is the Artist Spotlight Podcast Series, and today I have a very special guest here with me. I have Brian Bassett of Foghat. Brian, how you doing? I'm doing great, Beth. How are you? Good doing, to hear from you. You're doing fantastic. Thank you for talking to me today. I appreciate it. Mm-hmm, my pleasure. So we'll talk about Foghat's new album, Sonic Mojo, that just came out on November 10th of this year in just a bit. But first, there's a few things we definitely have to talk about first. <laughs> Tell me how you got your start in music and some of your early influences. Well, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And, uh, of course, I think my biggest influence, like many musicians my age, were the uh, Ed Sullivan shows and the British Invasion bands. I'd watch the Beatles show and uh, the Stones, the Doors, and all that. It was a very exciting time in music. That Christmas, I think everyone in my neighborhood got a guitar or a drum or something. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, there's a lot of basements and garage beds in my neighborhood. And uh, that's where it started. And I was still probably, like, eh, just before high school. And I played guitar and tried to you know learn how to play all through high school and really right after graduation i started playing in the nightclubs in the pittsburgh area and it was a very fertile ground there was hundreds of clubs all over the tri-state area including west virginia ohio and parts of new york and we were playing four or five nights a week we were cover band and um you know you played the hits on the radio uh, basically four or five nights a week four hours a night so it was a pretty good training ground for learning my craft And that was the beginning of it. And I eventually joined a band called uh, Wild Cherry, and we had a hit record in 1976, and that really started my professional career. And that big hit, play that funky music. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) I always say, hey, we made the wedding circuit. You know, (laughs) that song is still around, and you hear it at a lot of family parties, and, you know, it's still a good dance tune. The opening line, uh, dun, 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 you know, that's nine notes. And I always say, I played a million notes in my life, but those nine notes will be the ones I'm probably remembered for the beginning of that song. There you uh, go. (laughs) (laughs) So, but it's nice to have at least, you know, something out in the, in the population that people recognize and it's i've had a lot of fun with that song over the years so you were in wild cherry and then even though you weren't on the song i don't think you can correct me if i'm wrong you flirted with disaster a little bit with molly hatchet (laughs) and then went on to fog hat when were you in molly hatchet well that actually came about after my time in pittsburgh i relocated to uh, florida in the mid 80s I began working with a record company called King Snake Records. It was a blues label, indie label, and we did productions for Alligator, Rounder, Blacktop, Itchy Barn, and um, other types of blues-oriented labels. Plus, we had our own King Snake label as well. And I did that for many years, actually, and I also had a quartet, a blues band, that played the Orlando area. And uh, one night, my friend Pat Travers, the great blues guitarist and well, rock guitarist, was a friend of ours, and he brought Lonesome Dave to one of our shows, and we played really eclectic blues numbers like Lightning Slim, Lazy Lester, what you would call Swamp Blues was sort of our forte. That was uh, what we did, and um, Dave came in one night, and we hit it off as friends. He knew every song on our list and sat in and played, and that was my introduction to uh, the Foghat family, meeting Lonesome Dave. I toured with him for four years, and on our last tour in Europe, right before all the original members of Fog had reformed, um, I did a tour with Molly Hatchett, became friends with Danny Joe Brown, and uh, as 1992 wound down, he asked me if I wanted to join Molly Hatchett, which I did, and I stayed with them for seven years and did three albums. I played for Flirting with Disaster hundreds of times, but I'm not on the original record. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that one's just a classic, and that was one that actually stood out to me. And then me being, you know, a little youngster as I was, I was like, you know, that Molly Hatchet, it's a strange name for a guy, but... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, who's a smolly person? Yeah, I was like, that, that's not a good. Actually, I think yeah. So she was actually an, an axe murderess, I think. You know, something in the mid, in, in the 1900s or something. You know, so yeah, it's an interesting name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From each band that you have been in, what would you say are some of your favorite memories? that you have been a part of? Well, you know, I think touring all over Europe as a young person was really exciting and uh, and getting to meet so many of my heroes of Wild Touring, that was really great. With Wild Cherry, we played with everybody in the R&B world at the time, Average White Band, Commodores, Jackson 5, Isley Brothers. I mean, I can hardly think of someone I didn't work with then. So just meeting all those people was really exciting. Another thing that was cool when I was with Wild Cherry, you know, my parents were supportive of my music career, but it, 
I turned down a college scholarship to uh, go live in a condemned house in Ohio with my band. <laughs> and so years later, when I was playing at the Civic Arena, the big place in Pittsburgh, with my parents in attendance, that's always a great memory for me. At least they uh, you know, realized I didn't make a horrible mistake. <laughs> <laughs> you made it work for you, right? <laughs> right. There was actually a picture that I saw, and my husband and I just moved to Moline, Illinois, last month, actually. And we're not too far from Rockford, Illinois, which is home to Cheap Trick. And I saw a picture of you and Rick Nilsson of Cheap Trick. Um, yeah, we love, we love Cheap Trick. Yeah, we do too. <laughs> <laughs> How did that meeting come about? Oh, we've known them for 20 years, really. We just do a lot of concerts together. And, um, you know, hopefully we do some more coming this year. But we always seem to do four or five shows with them. And, uh, yeah, it's always fun. I love Rick. You know, great guitar player. The band's fantastic. And I uh, forward to playing with them every time we can. I talked to Garnet Grimm of Savoy Brown a while back um, about a little bit of everything. But the main thing we discussed was the late, great Kim Simmons, who sadly passed away in December of 2022. I know you have memories of Kim, too. Tell me about his influence on Foghat and you personally. Well, of course, Foghat started with three members of Savoy Brown in 1971. Um, Dave and Roger and Tony left Savoy Brown and created Foghat. And so Roger and Kim have been lifelong friends. My relationship with Kim started about eight years ago. When we did our last studio record, it was called Under the Influence. Mm -hmm. And we had him guest star on it as a guitar player. It was great. I was great to meet him. He was one of my heroes. So when we started preparations for this new record, we asked him if he had any songs he'd want us to check out or we wanted him to play on the record. He sent us four demo tapes, three of his compositions. We worked up and and they're on the record. His health turned bad and he uh, passed away. He wasn't able to play on the record, but we're pretty blessed to have three of his last Uh, compositions on our record so we're proud of that and we have fond memories of Tim for sure we did many shows together over the years that's one that I'm sad I didn't have a chance to see or meet right Kim Simmons had Savoy Brown his whole career Mm -hmm. you know after the guys you know started Fog Hat he had fabulous musicians all the way up until his passing I mean we did a show with him just weeks you know before his he took a downturn on his health we'll miss him he was a great guy I read, I think it was somewhere over 60 different artists that worked or were a part of Savoy Brent. Like they've had so many, so many different members of the band. (laughs) For sure, you know, and I know several of them and and every version of it was great. And and at the end, Kim was actually playing as a trio, which I thought was a great, a fabulous format for him. He's such a fantastic guitarist and singer and they had a great rhythm section and he was playing as a trio and sounded really great up and you know up until the very last show so i right. thought that was a great format for him but he over the years he's had um you know several different lead singers and different bass players and such but um it was always kim's uh, kim's direction and you know playing his great songs and, and playing the blues and it has now turned into a johnny cash song over here uh there is a train coming so <laughs> <laughs> If you hear that train of coming. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming down the train. <laughs> That's one of the few things that we can hear in the new place we're in it is the train every time it comes down. They have to make sure they honk three, four times. <laughs> <laughs> we have, well, I worked at a studio in uh, Pittsburgh, a recording studio that had, we had streetcars and, you know, on rails. And when there was one right outside our door, so we had their schedule posted, you know, on the door. So you would know to stop your recording while the streetcar went by ringing its bell three exactly. or four times a day. I know what you're going through. Yeah. Another fun fact I read about you was that you taught at college for a while. Are you still teaching now? And what is or was that experience like? I did love it. I'm not doing it any longer. Okay. I was an adjunct professor at Daytona State College, and it was called the Mike Curb School of uh, Arts and Entertainment. And it was a recording studio, t- you know, teaching classes of that, music law, video editing, recording engineering. And I taught, you might see like the School of Rock. I had what they called contemporary ensembles. So we wanted all the students that belonged, went to the school to have the experience of playing in the band. Now, there were some really great musicians and other people were more technically oriented. I had three classes and uh, three different bands. 
and they performed a couple times every semester. And it was to give them, even if they were going to be an eventual recording engineer, it would give them the experience of from the musician side of the glass. And and that's basically what I talked about, um, the you know professional recording techniques, um, how to re- run a band rehearsal, and worked on songs. How you know, I mean, I had many years learning hundreds of songs as a club musician, and I just sort of brought those some of those things and tried to teach them some of those skills and how to ear train. And things like that. I did it for four or five years, and but being an adjunct professor, um, they had a new president come into the university, and of course, all the teachers at the college level were supposed to have master's degrees, and I was teaching on letter of acceptance, so they closed my classes down. But I had a lot of fun with it, and uh, it was always hilarious for people to call me Professor Bassett. I'm not technically a professor, <laughs> but they go Professor Bassett. I go who? who? Oh yeah, that's not me. Who, okay, who is this guy? <laughs> But, you know, it's funny, a lot of my students I keep in touch with, and a lot of them have gone on to open studios or go, you know, one of them went into video editing, several of them moved to Los Angeles, several to New York, a couple to Nashville. You know, so it's just nice when you uh, do teach to, to keep in touch with the kids you work with and see how their uh, their lives are going. I know, I promise. Foghat's new album, Sonic Mojo. <laughs> it was released <laughs> on November 10th, 2023. You have been with fog hat since when like 1999 yes yeah, so straight since 99 and four years with dave in the late 80s so yeah okay. over 20 over 20 years now there you go so with this new album what can listeners and fans or expect to hear from this new album this um, album is really song oriented and it's uh, when i was mixing it it sort of hit me like they came up in twosies we have like two country leaning songs two rock songs two straight blues songs and a couple swamp blues, you know, fog hat, boogie numbers. We were sort of shocked that all the songs came in under four minutes, which is unusual for us. We like to jam and play, you know, long guitar solos and all that. But this album was more song oriented. It ended up with six originals and six covers. Foghead had the tradition and we still continue it of covering some of our old blues favorites. And um, we try them out at Soundcheck as we travel around in our concert sound checks. Scott Holt, our singer, played with Buddy Guy for 10 years and more. He has a, like a library of songs in his head, and he'll just pop out a blues song during sound check, and we jam to it. And every once in a while, one sounds really great and different enough from the original that we put it on our list for future recording. And that's sort of how we compiled the tracks for the cover tracks for the album, is just by making up a list of songs that we really enjoyed playing and that our take on it's a little bit different. And then the originals, you know, three uh, were inspired by Kim's demos. And then the other ones we just wrote in our studio. And uh, that's pretty much how the record got put together. We compile tracks as over the, you know, couple of years we rehearse every winter and record. And once we get a group of songs that we think hangs together in a package, then we start up the process of releasing it, which now is uh, Sonic Mojo. So we're so happy it's out there on the streets. It, doesn't seem like seven years since our last studio record, but it, it has been. We just spend a lot of time traveling and touring, so time <laughs> rushes by. But um, I think everyone will like it. It's pretty much old school fog hat. There's a little bit of uh, country stuff in there. You know, we have a bunch of Johnny Cash lovers in, in our band. And, and uh, one of the songs, um, Wish I'd Been There, was written by Roger's brother, Colin Earl, who is the pianist for Mungo Jerry. Remember that? In the summertime. That's Mungo Jerry, and that's Roger's brother, Colin, on the piano. Oh. Okay. He sent, yeah, he sent the lyrics to I Wish I'd Been There, which is the lyric in the song is about him wishing that he had been at a Hank Williams Sr. concert and what that would have been like. That's what the song is about. He sent Roger the lyrics, I guess, a year or so ago, and um, he pulled them out, and we just constructed a song around it, and it came out a little countryish, but it's a really good song. And I think everyone will like it. So that's a little bit different for us. But other than that, it's just a lot of you know good guitar playing. We did pretty short arrangements, and uh, it was really song oriented this time, as opposed to like say jamming, uh, influencing everything. So that's Sonic Mojo. So there's 12 tracks on the CD, and we have there's the bonus track on there, and then 11 on our vinyl release, which um, is pretty cool. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's purple vinyl, and it's uh, awesome looking. <laughs> so, um, we have several of those available. We were into vinyl before the vinyl craze, but now we're still into it <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yes i've i've pulled my uh, all my old stereos out of storage and uh my daughter's older daughters i almost got rid of my record collection but they stopped me from that too so now yeah. my daughter's bedroom looks like mine did in 1974 <laughs> there you go <laughs> all my old records are laying around and the turntables up and the speakers 
So it's pretty cool. Off of the new album, Sonic Mojo, do you have a favorite track off of it? Time Slips Away is, is one of my favorites. We don't usually do like down tempo songs that much unless they're a slow blues you know kind of thing but this is a song that was written by kim and it, i thought the lyrics were very poignant considering you know it was one of the last songs he wrote and then he passed away but so that one's a personal favorite i like the rodney crow song that we covered too because we do a way different take on it than the original the original was almost like a in a three four time country acoustic thing and we took it in a whole new direction but once again we love the lyrics on that and it's funny because roger for years has been walking around singing this one line and it goes, he goes i don't drink as much as i ought to so <laughs> <laughs> he didn't. He laughs, and so we finally said, "What is that song? What? Where's that lyric from?" And we found it was a, uh, it was from that Rodney Crowell song. And uh, so we gave him a call, and and we recorded it. And that's that's a good one. That's sort of an earworm for me too. She's a little bit of everything is a good one. It's sort of like ZZ Topish. You know, yeah, that's that one's sort of my one favorite. Of <laughs> yeah, that's the one that opens the album. So that one's just a straight up rock blues song, a la ZZ Top, and it sort of fits you know the fog hat mold. What's cool about this record, I mean, it's a lot of different influences on it, but Roger's drumming is very unique and sort of sets the tone for every Foghat record. He's been on every single one of them. And the way he plays, he's sort of a combination of a shuffle drummer and a backbeat drummer, which is an unusual combination to be able to do both well. And it sort of sets the style and the bottom of all the songs that we record have his underpinning rhythmic you know sense and the grooves he likes to play and the way and the songs he wants to play uh that sort of sets the tone for every fog hat record including this one there is a band that i have to tell you about there's fog hat and then there's a surf instrumental band called frog hat <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I can't with that name. We had a baby hat in our merch a couple of years ago, and that's exactly what it was. It was a little frog head, uh, <laughs> and it said frog hat on it. So that was we actually had a merch item with that. So it's funny. Every once in a while, you'll talk to someone that's not really familiar with us, and they'll say, what, "What's the name? Frog hat?" But sure. <laughs> you know, uh, when I was in Molly Hatch, we played somewhere in Germany, and they had it frog head, and then Molly Hatch was Molly Hatched, like you know, eggs hatched. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, so they're sort of funny. I, we collect those kind of funny names. It's one that really just jumped out at me. I mean, my, my husband does a uh, surf show called Catching a Wave, and he plays a lot of surf instrumentals and stuff like that. And Frog Hat is one that he plays heavily. So I'm like, I have to bring up Frog Hat to, <laughs> <laughs> to a member of Fog Hat. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. No, um, mm. I had asked you earlier about your uh past influences do you have any current influences or even new artists you really just like listening to yeah i mean i keep up with the you know, with music pretty much although you know I, I had a lot of favorite bands that came out in the 90s i was a real fan of the seattle sound you know i like pearl jam sound garden uh, modest smiles i really like those bands uh, you know i'm particularly keep an eye on new guitar players coming out i like chris stone stuff joe bonamassa you know the great blues players Derek trucks fabulous slide player i mean geez he's from our the local area i live at now and i had him in my studio when he was just a pre-teen i think he was 10 or 11 years old came in and was like channeling Dwayne Allman. So he's absolutely amazing guitarist. So yeah, I listen to those guys. Um, you know, I'm a Jeff Beck fan my whole life. So when I get on a plane, usually one of his albums, you know, goes on in my headphones. No one can play like him. He can always try, but no one will ever be able to play the way he played. You know, and I was really influenced by a lot of the early blues British players, Mick Taylor, Peter Green, Eric Clapton, of course, and then later Jimmy Page. And, you know, and then the American guys that I liked a lot were, of course, Billy Gibbons and um, Rick Nilsson. You know, I liked his, his playing, of course, and um, Johnny Winter, Dwayne Allman. You know, so, I mean, the being a guitar player and the years that I grew up in trying to learn, there were so many great guitar players to listen to and learn from. There's a lot of influences. And then playing all those cover tunes in the clubs exposes you to all kinds of different genres of music. And so that was a, a big part of my learning curve, too. It was, uh, you know, learning a little bit of country, some blues, you know, some rock, you know, some R&B. So a lot of music, uh, particularly in the 70s, you know, that's where I formed my style. And that is where all my influences came from. Now, I didn't hear you list them. I didn't really expect you to list them. But I just always like to add ask about jackson brown are you a fan of jackson brown he plays uh, guitar course, yeah. come on now yeah i love jackson brown i mean principally a songwriter i mean a great songwriter but yeah. you know he had he always had a great band i saw him several times in pittsburgh 
you know, I love just love his songs and, and and the live recordings that he made with that band were just fantastic. So, yeah, of course, yeah, like like Jackson Brown, definitely. He was at the very very top of my like bucket list of people to see live, and I finally saw him live this year actually. Mm. Um, and I was like, I, I'm done. Yeah, I saw him back in the day when he had Dave, uh, David Lindley playing lap steel. Yeah, and that guy. That guy was just unbelievably great. It still is, you know. But um, you know, he really made a lot of those live recordings back in the day. Now, along the same lines of current influences or anything like that, is there an artist that you wish you could work with that you haven't yet? Oh yeah, well, there's several. You know, I I never got to jam with Eric. I never, you know, or Jeff. Those those are my two biggest regrets. But you know, I get to play with a lot of. A lot of great musicians. There's a big blues scene down here in Florida, and all my years working at King Snake Records, you know, I got to play with Gatemouth Brown and um, Noble Watts, who was a great saxophone player, and um, Matt Adderley, you know, great cornet player, and all the artists, um, Kenny Neal, Lucky Peterson, great, you know, big blues artists that we recorded, and actually we did their first records at King Snake. So yeah, I don't have any regrets, you know, but I do like to jam anytime I get the opportunity. <laughs> so yeah. whoever we happen to run into. If you could travel back in time to any year, what year would you pick? Uh, seventy six. Seventy six. <laughs> when play that funky music came out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That was pretty exciting. You know, it was like a movie for us, you know, because the record charted so fast. We were still playing clubs and went right from the clubs to the arenas, which was there's some funny stories there. We got to our first show opening up for Santana and Journey, the Journey before Steve Perry. They were like a fusion band, but we open, had the opening slot. We set up our equipment on stage and found out our guitar cords weren't long enough to reach the mic line. So, oh, we had to run out. <laughs> so, so we learned pretty quick. We had a steep learning curve transfer, uh, you know, transferring from clubs to arenas. And uh, we hired a production company to help us with that. But it, some of those early things were mind boggling. We we're like, oh my God, you know, we're not even going to be able to reach the mics. What are we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> that was a great year. You know, I was young, uh, first time on a national tour and um, a hit record. And we went to the Grammys that year. So that was a pretty good one. If you could pick mm -hmm. three to five albums to take with you to a desert island, which three to five albums would you pick? At least two Jeff Beck albums. Uh, the very first one, Beck Ola, and probably there and back. i take uh, Pat Metheny's Travels live CD from many years ago. That's one of my go-to airplane records. And I'd bring uh, Allman Brothers live at the Fillmore. Nice. Yeah, I'm a big Allman Brothers fan. Greg Allman. Mainly for him. I know you're you're bigger into Dwayne being a guitar player, but I'm I'm sure. the Greg fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he you know he's from Daytona Beach area, and the guy that owned King Snake Records and him were childhood friends and played together in the in the bands here on the beach before they became famous. Yeah, and um, so they were considered local musicians here in the Daytona Beach area. Sonic Mojo just came out November tenth, twenty twenty three. What is next? For Foghat, or f for you in general? Um, just to finish out the touring season, we just did a record release party at the Iridium Club up in New York, where Les Paul used to have a residency for many years. It's, it's just a little club, but it's a you know prestigious one. So we just did that the other day, and I'm flying to Los Angeles tomorrow to play the Coach House for another record release party. And then I think we have you know, about six or eight shows left for the year, and then we go into rehearsals, prepare for the next concert season. So we try to change the set. We're going to incorporate songs from the new album into the set, and um, that's pretty much our yearly schedule. You know, we play most of the year, and the end of December and January we rehearse and record some, and then go back out on the road. So for people that have been living under a rock and have not heard of the band Foghat, um, where could they? <laughs> I'm sorry, was that mean? No. Uh, <laughs> Nah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, hey, we're you know, uh, we had Slow Ride was on the one of the Guitar Hero games. Yeah, a couple of years ago, and that brought a lot of young people that didn't know who Fog it was to our shows. You know, so now we have like three generations: our original fans, which are now grandparents, their kids, and then their kids' kids. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with, a, with their game with their game guitars coming up, so we sign them, you know, autographs on them and stuff. We're glad to have a name recognition, and we have a pretty strong fan base, and we're happy for that. That's what keeps us going. But for the two people that are listening that haven't heard of Foghat, where could they find out more information? Do you guys have social media, website, all that fun stuff? Yeah, we have all of that. 
But uh, principally go to foghat.com for all your foghat needs. There you go. <laughs> and, then, and, there's all, and then everything's connected there. You know, I think we have, you know, we have everything, Instagram, Facebook, um, TikTok, all that stuff. Our torch schedule in particular is on foghat.com as well as our merchandise and then connection to foghat wine, which is uh, foghatsellers.com. So, yeah, that's the best place to go. Very cool. Well, Brian Bassett, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, thanks. Same here. Thanks for having me.